Alrighty, history fans, welcome to another exciting edition of History 102. In this lecture, we're going to take a look at the Spanish, French, and English empires now in the 18th century, in the 1700s. In our first two lectures, we examined those processes by which European powers came to colonize North America in the 15 and 1600s the french the spanish and english would all establish empires in that period and we examined elements of that process why they came who came uh, their respective economies and their different ways of relating to native americans now in this lecture and one to follow part two of this look at imperial rivalries in the 18th century we're going to talk about how those empires evolve in the 1700s, in the 18th century. And as we do so, we have an opportunity once again to emphasize that of the three, the Spanish, the French, and the English, the English will be the most successful, powerful, populous, and the seedbed, the foundation of the American nation. As we'll see through the course of these two lectures examining imperial rivalries in the 18th century, by the end of the 1700s, the English Empire is clearly the most powerful and eclipses the French and Spanish. But out of that English Empire will come the American Revolution and the formation of a new nation, the United States. So as we go forward and examine imperial rivalries in the 18th century in these two lectures, be keenly sharply aware of that, how the English are indeed becoming the most powerful, but how trends within the English colonies, which we'll in particular talk about in our next lecture, serve to form the basis of that American Revolution. Let's begin our look here at imperial rivalries in the 1700s by checking in with the Spanish. And when we talked about the Spanish Empire in our first lecture, we talked about how the Spanish were thinly populated in frontier regions like Santa Fe, where you had that fateful Pueblo Rebellion of 1680. The Spanish were able to attract a lot of settlers to certain urban areas, but frontier reaches like Tejas, Alta California, um, the settlement at Santa Fe in what is modern day New Mexico, those areas of the northern reaches of the Spanish Empire were thinly populated. And so the Spanish might claim control, but like we talked about with the Pueblo Revolt, they either had to share control or really didn't exert control over regions where there were so few Spanish settlers and still large populations of Native Americans. However, in the late 17th century and early 18th century, there was an effort by the Spanish to try to expand their empire and develop it further, to populate it more and be a true rival to the English, who as we talked about and revisit here, were really emerging as the dominant power in North America. There was a new king, a new dynasty in Spain, a young hip king who wanted to further develop his empire in North America, New Spain. And so there's a concerted effort by the Spanish government in the late 17th and early 18th century to expand the Spanish Empire by further developing that empire, uh, developing it economically, more mining, more agriculture, and stabilize relations with Native Americans because as we saw with the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, this was one problem that plagued the Spanish Empire, that because they had to convert the Native Americans, Native Americans often resisted that in acts of rebellion like that of the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. As part of this effort to expand their empire, make it more profitable and successful, the Spanish in the early 1700s would attempt to establish new settlements in those thinly populated regions in the northern part of New Spain, like Tejas and Alta California. And so this begins things like the mission effort to build missions in California. We are all keenly aware of this. 
here locally. If you are educated in the California public school system, you probably had that moment in third grade or so where you went to a mission on a field trip, where you learned about the missions in school, where you may have been tasked with making your own mission. And if yours was like mine, it was pathetic. It was all lumpy, you know, this terrible paper mache thing that you pooped out the night before it was due. So a lot of us are keenly aware of this aspect of North American history, American history, California history, the mission movement that began here in the 1700s where the Spanish Empire sent conquistadors and friars in an effort to further develop their empire by building missions in California as well as reaching into other areas of northern New Spain or the northern reaches of the Spanish Empire like Texas. Here is a image of the missions that were established in California. And again, most of us are aware of this from grade school. Uh, the very first mission built in uh, San Diego and then uh, a number of other missions built not uh, linearly, we didn't go up the coast, uh, more strategic areas like the bays and uh, other natural resources of interest, Monterey, um, what is San Francisco, those would be built before some of the other missions, but cumulatively there's this effort to build a number of missions throughout California, Alta California here in the 1700s and 18th century as part of Spain's effort to truly rival the English and be a formidable strong empire to not uh, accept second class status and they wanted to expand, they wanted to develop their holdings, they wanted to stabilize relations with Native Americans to have a more stable empire and part of that was again this effort to build missions here in Alta, California. The man behind that effort to build missions in Alta, California was Father Unapero Serra who was really tasked with this duty of pushing the Spanish Empire north into areas like Alta California in the early 1700s. Father Serra was the leader of that effort. He would establish the mission system. And the mission system was one that really relied on friars, on priests, Catholic priests, to do this work of expanding the Spanish Empire. And that again brings us back to some of the core ideas we developed in our very first lecture that conversion was at the heart of the Spanish Empire, that from the very beginning, the Spanish needed the Native Americans to justify their empire. That's why they were able to receive the sanction of the Pope. That's why the Pope uh, writes up that Treaty of Tordesillas and says, go forward and convert the Native Americans. The Spanish Empire was predicated on this idea, we're there to do the work of God and convert Native Americans. And that continued here in the 1700s, now pushing northward towards Alta California. Um, the missions were established by Catholic priests. Uh, the largest Spanish population of uh, settlers in this region are Catholic priests. Again, one of the core characteristics of the Spanish Empire alongside this imperative to convert Native Americans is that they really struggle to attract settlers to parts of the frontier northern regions like Alta California and Tejas. Um, at this point, nobody knows there's gold in California. Gold will not be discovered in California until 1848. Um, so there's no gold. Um, it's an arid, hot landscape that really won't be turned into fertile farmland until the development of aqueducts and dams and other means that are able to channel water to places like Southern California, which is a desert. So you can't farm there. There's no gold to be had. And therefore, not too many Spanish settlers came to Alta California. It was mostly run by the friars like Father Sarah. And as a result of that, uh, this was ultimately a disaster for Native Americans because here come these friars and once again, they see Native Americans as backward, savage, heathens. They see their duty and task to be one of converting Native Americans. They have that imperative that's again at the heart of the Spanish Empire, gold, glory, and God. And so the friars, like Sarah and others, reach out to these Native Americans and attempt to convert them. 
And that, of course, is disastrous for Native Americans because they're facing this cultural onslaught, this effort to stamp out their traditions and impose Catholicism upon them, but also in the Spanish effort to urge Native Americans to come and live at the missions, work at the missions. It's important to note that the missions weren't just churches. They weren't just places where people worshipped. They were farms, and labor had to be performed on those farms. And the friars didn't do the labor. The friars said, we have other work to do. We're busy converting Native Americans and uh, speaking for God. Native Americans were forced to work on those farms in return for salvation and religious instruction. This was the way in which the friars saw this relationship. We're here to bring you God and bring you into the light of Christianity, and so it's only fair that you do all the work and feed us. Well, as a result of this, there's a very high death rate for Native Americans who are now exposed to, again, the pathogens that the Spaniards carried. And of course, this was also very hard on Native Americans because they were doing this grueling labor in the hot sun. Um, and so Native Americans faced a cultural onslaught, but they also suffered from a miserable experience with a high death rate owing to pathogens and forced labor on these farms where they were expected to do the work to generate the food to feed themselves and the friars. Um, and so this was, again, a tragedy for Native Americans that the Spaniards arrived dedicated to expanding their empire and uh, convert Native Americans, and Native Americans in the process uh, face um, an effort to stamp out their religion and culture, and many Native Americans resist. The very first mission built in San Diego was burned to the ground, and Native Americans in that region revolted against the Spanish and killed the Spanish friars. The mission that stands now in San Diego is actually the second one because the first one was burned to the ground. So again, like you had in the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, when you come into a region and tell people they're backward, savage, uncivilized, and they have to give up their religion, well, sometimes people don't exactly like that, and they resist and rebel. Um, so some Native Americans resented this introduction of Spanish settlers and resisted, but Native Americans who did uh, come to live at the missions suffered from, again, a high death rate from pathogens and forced labor. Father Sarah, represented here again, is in the news a lot right now because statues of him have been targeted in the current effort to remove monuments to people who are seen as distasteful to our sensibilities today who are, again, Confederates or pro-slavery sympathizers. Um, and a number of statues of Father Sarah have recently been, been torn down because of his role in what many see as a crime against Native Americans. Despite these efforts, um, the uh, mission effort ultimately would be a failure in terms of the goals of the Spanish crown, the Spanish government, to expand their empire because so few Spaniards made their way to Alta California. It again was mostly a part of the Spanish empire governed and controlled by friars. This is before the gold rush. No one knows there's gold in California. It's hard to farm in the region. There are these formidable Native Americans who are able to resist the Spanish and often do rebel. So why leave the Valley of Mexico? Why leave parts of the Spanish Empire where there is gold, where there is silver, where it's easier to farm, and head off to Alta California? So um, the Spanish Empire continued to be plagued by this problem that helps explain for us here why it does not become the most powerful, populous, and profitable of these efforts. We may live in Southern California. We may see markers of this history around us in the mission system and the commemoration of it. We might have in our state statues to Father Sarah. You um, are surrounded by Spanish place names. But despite that, I am lecturing to you today and in all lectures in English because it is the English who become the most successful of these colonial efforts. And that's really solidified, as we'll see in these lectures, in the 18th century and the 1700s. The Spanish tried to expand their empire, but it was a failure. There's very little economic development in California or Texas. Uh, Native Americans resist their efforts. By 1800, at the end of the, of the 18th century, the end of the 1700s, after this experiment by the Spanish in Alta California, in 1800, there are only 300 people living in Los Angeles. 
I know it's hard to imagine. There once was an age where there were only 300 people living in Los Angeles, in the entire city. Then in 1800, Los Angeles was part of the Spanish Empire here in Alta California. And its very sparse, limited population speaks to how unsuccessful the Spanish were in this effort. So after having for a few slides here discussed the failure of the Spanish in the 1700s to develop their empire and be true rivals to the English, let's now turn our attention to the French and a growing collision, a clash between the French and those growing populous and profitable English colonies. As we talked about in our second lecture, the French established an empire in North America in the 1600s. And one of the cardinal central elements of the French Empire in North America is their close alliance with Native Americans, the middle ground that we talked about. So the French and Native Americans entered into alliances so the French could hunt in the tribal lands of Native Americans and um, the Native Americans agreed to defend the French settlers from other Native American tribes and in turn the Native Americans got all kinds of tribute and treasure and basically payments of sorts for their loyalty. That was the system we described in our second lecture as we sketched out the French Empire. But also in that second lecture we talked about the English Empire which as we said through a number of factors was growing in population and by the early 1700s was beginning to press westward. As the English Empire grows in population, as they war against Native Americans in events like King Philip's War, which we talked about in our second lecture, at the end of King Philip's War, the English are more unified, more powerful than ever. They win this great victory against King Philip and his men, and then in the decades after, they begin to march further and further west, confident that they deserve that land, land, and land. By the early to mid 1700s, the English are growing in population, they're pressing westward, and they're pressing into regions that had been claimed by the French, like the Ohio River Valley. For a little while, with these now English settlers arriving in the Ohio River Valley, the Native Americans were able to take advantage of this by pitting these two powers against each other. So the French have been here since the 1600s. The French, again, colonized that middle ground of North America from Canada through the Great Lakes region, eventually down to the mouth of the Mississippi River. But into that area in the middle of the continent, into places like the Ohio River Valley, um, south of the Great Lakes, come the British, who have been growing in population, pressing westward. And for a little while, the Native Americans say, hey, now there's these other white guys, there's these other Europeans here, and maybe they've got cool stuff for us, and so let's sell our loyalty to them. And then the French say, no, 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 remain loyal to us, and we'll give you even more tribute. So for a little while, Native Americans, when there wasn't a clear dominant force in this region of the interior of the North American continent, in areas like the Ohio River Valley, that the French had long claimed, but now here come the uh, British as rivals to that claim. For a little while, Native Americans were able to play the two rivals off of each other and sell their loyalty to the highest bidder. The British come in and say, hey, uh, don't be loyal to the French, be loyal to us. We've got great stuff to give you. And Native Americans say, okay. And the French in turn say, but, 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 but you've always been loyal to us. Here, we'll give you even more tribute. So for a little while, Native Americans were able to really take advantage of this and pit the two against each other to extract the greatest tribute possible and maintain control over their own affairs. But over time, and certainly by the mid 1700s, the mid 18th century, more and more British settlers are pouring into the Ohio River Valley. And they're doing so for again, what I have urged you to put in the forefront of your thinking and understanding regarding the English or the British. You can use either uh, term here land land and land from the very beginning the english came for land they came as permanent settlers they saw themselves as worthy of that land seeing native americans in contrast as unworthy of that land we talked about uh bacon's rebellion we talked about king philip's war these flashpoint events that are occurring in the late 1600s 
that demonstrate that the English are pressing westward, clashing with Native Americans, determined to expand their claims to land, and that only intensifies and amplifies in the period we're reviewing here of the early 1700s. And so the British are growing in population. They're pressing westward, and eventually this leads to a collision with the French in that Ohio River Valley, in that interior part of the continent. The French, as we stressed in our second lecture, also struggled from underpopulation. The French could never convince enough of their citizens to get on a boat, sail across the Atlantic, and populate New France. And so the French are underpopulated. That's why they relied on alliances with Native Americans. And here come this large population of settlers, the British, who are all determined to take this land that the French had long claimed. And this will set up a war, a war that ultimately will lead to the end of the French Empire and the solidification of the English as the dominant power in North America. So we are setting up, as the slide indicates, a battle, a battle for control of North America with the British or English growing in population, pressing westward, buoyed by their confidence and unity against Native Americans, willing to wage wars of aggression like we saw in King Philip's war against Native Americans, they're pouring into this region. And they're often doing so with the sanction of colonial legislatures. So as we talked about in our second lecture, the English are unique of these three empires we're examining here early in the class in that they set up local legislatures. The English were unique because they came to North America with a sense that rights are given to you by being English, by simply by being born an English citizen you have a right to things like a representative government, uh, pursuit of private ownership of land. And so they set up those legislatures, which, which we, again, we talked about in our second lecture, like the House of Burgesses. Now we noted, again, they're not uh, representative bodies of the many. They can't be described as democratic institutions because the only people who could vote or serve in these legislatures were property owning white men. So limited based on race, gender, and class because you had to own property, but they are set up and they represent the interest of property owners. And what do property owners want? Well, more property, land, land, and land. And so you have the dynamic we talked about in the previous slide where the English are pressing into the Ohio River Valley and they're doing so with the sanction of these legislatures that says, go out there, take that land. Go and claim land that, again, was part of the French Empire, that the French had claimed in parts of North America, in the middle of the continent, in areas like the Ohio River Valley. In 1749, in the midpoint of the 1700s, the midpoint here of the 18th century, the Virginia legislature, the House of Burgesses, the very first of these legislatures, says to its citizens of Virginia, here, here's half a million acres. Go and claim that land. Now, in our most recent lecture about the origins of slavery in the English colonies, we noted that after Bacon's Rebellion, there's this very deliberate effort by not just the legislature in Virginia, where Bacon's Rebellion took place, but in all colonial legislatures to secure more and more land for white men so that they can realize their ambitions of owning land and really, again, uh, solidify that solidarity of white men who see themselves united. And here's proof of this. Here's proof that in the decades that followed Bacon's Rebellion, those legislatures are doing their best to appropriate and take land and do so so that uh, their, the English citizens can realize their land owning ambitions. So in 1749, Virginia legislature says here, here's half a million acres, go and populate that region. And well, uh, English settlers who are motivated by land, land, and land, who want to own land, be permanent settlers of that land, who believe that that land out there is theirs for the taking. That the Native Americans who have lived on that land for thousands of years are backward, savage, unworthy of that land. The British who think that way are more than willing to pour into that region. 
the French say, wait a minute, this is our land. We've been here since the 1600s, and um, we claim this land in the Ohio River Valley. And so you have, again, the basis for this collision where the land is in dispute and it's unclear who really controls this region. The French had claimed control of this region since the arrival of the French in the 1600s. They've entered into these alliances with Native Americans to be able to develop their fur trade economy centered on you know, hunting beavers and weasels and extracting their furs. They've entered into these alliances with Native Americans to defend the French. But here come these English settlers who are determined to wrest control of this land, who say our legislature said this land's ours. And ultimately, this comes to a head in a key and fateful war in world history, and certainly a key and fateful war in American colonial history, the Seven Years' War which begins here in North America in 1754. Later, battles would be fought in Europe between the French and the British and the Spanish who get involved in the war on the side of the French. In 1756, those first battles begin and the war lasts until 1763. So uh, if you can do a little bit of math, even us history majors can do this much math, you can see that based on the dates given on this slide, the war lasts nine years. So calling it the Seven Years' War doesn't really make a lot of sense. The reason why it's called the Seven Years' War is that the war only begins in 1756 in Europe. This is what Europeans call this war because in Europe it spans from 1756 to 1763, and that is seven years. But actually the very first battles began here in North America as early as 1754. So that explains why a war that really lasts nine years is known as the Seven Years' War. Seven Years' War is the term that Europeans used to describe this conflict because eventually battles would be fought throughout the continent of Europe between the French and Spanish and their opponent, the British. It's known in American history, in U.S. history, as the French and Indian War. But that name, too, is misleading because you hear this term French and Indian War when you think, well, the French fought the Indians, right? If it's the French and Indian War, it's French versus Indian. And no, uh, as we've stated many times in this lecture and emphasized in our very uh, second lecture, the French and Indians were allies. It's called the French and Indian War because that's the perspective of the British colonies here. They are fighting the French and the Indians. So I'm sorry, um, the terms we historians have for this war don't really make sense. Seven Years' War actually lasts nine years. And the French and Indian War is one in which the French and Indians are actually allies. Uh, so sometimes history is a bitch, okay? The words we use, the terms we use as historians don't make, a sen don't make much sense, and I apologize for that. The key thing to know here is that this war, the Seven Years' War, French and Indian War if you prefer, is really in North America about who's going to control the interior of the continent. The French, who have long colonized this region, but are underpopulated, or this large population of determined British settlers who have poured into this region determined to seize this land, land, and land. Alrighty, so let's now describe the Seven Years' War after complaining about the terrible names we have for it. It's a war between the British settlers in the interior middle part of the continent and the French, who had long claimed that region, and their Native American allies, hence the term French and Indian War, because the British are fighting the French and Native Americans who had allied with the French again for decades. Um, you can think of the Seven Years' War as the First World War. It's not recognized as such. It's not recognized as World War I, um, but it meets the criteria of a world war as battles are fought literally all over the globe. The first battles begin here in North America in 1754. Uh, this leads to battles later in 1756, beginning then in Europe, and so battles are fought uh, in those two continents, and there are battles uh, fought in Asia as well. For example, during the Seven Years' War, the British attacked a Spanish colony, the Philippines, in Southeast Asia, and for a brief amount of time, the British held the Spanish, uh, the capital of that colony, 
Manila. So battles were fought in Asia as well. So battles were fought all over the world, three different continents. And so you can think of the Seven Years' War as the First World War, even though it's not recognized as such. Here in North America, the effort is one to control the Ohio River Valley. Again, the British had grown in population. They, from the very beginning, were determined to seize land, occupy land. They're more than willing to war against Native Americans for that land. And in the Seven Years' War, or French and Indian War, most of the battles were fought not between the British and the French, because there are so few French settlers here. Instead, most of the battles were between the British and Native Americans who were allied with the French as the British sought land, land, and land, and control of this region. The war was intense and brutal. We're talking about very close combat. Um, in this period, the most common firearm is a musket, and muskets were unreliable. Um, they weren't very accurate. You had to get very close to your uh, opponent to hit him with a musket. Um, when the musket failed, you were down to swords, hatchets, um, again, the sort of implements of war that must be utilized close in order to be effective. And so the warfare was very intense, very brutal, very close, very intimate in that way. Um, it wasn't like the more surgical forms of warfare that we uh, see in the 20th and 21st century where you can launch missiles from hundreds of miles away. Instead, the British fighting the French and their Native American allies were doing so very up close. And for the British, so much is at stake, their sense of freedom associated with that land. Another insight we've developed in these early lectures is that from the very beginning, in the English imagination, land represented freedom. And so when they're fighting for land, in their mind, they're fighting for freedom. The self-determination, the control of their lives that came with land ownership. The French were fighting for their control over this region, and Native Americans were also fighting to maintain their sovereignty, a sovereignty they often enjoyed through their close connection with the French. Also, there's a racist element to this. As we've talked about, uh, the British tended to see Native Americans through a racist lens as backward, savage, uncivilized, unworthy of occupying that land. In the aftermath of events in the 17th century, Bacon's Rebellion, and King Philip's War, those racial animosities, those racial prejudices were intensified. And so that too played a role in explaining why the warfare was so intense and brutal. And also some of the consequences of the war when it concludes, when this generation of British settlers engaged in close, direct combat with Native Americans, they began that effort already seeing Native Americans as backward, savage, and uncivilized, and only had those prejudices further confirmed. So that too plays a role in the reason why this warfare was so intense and brutal. It began as a rivalry for control over the interior of the continent. A lot was at stake, land and the notions of freedom and independence associated with it. The British who entered this war, began this war, seeing Native Americans as backward, savage, uncivilized through that racist lens, emerged out of the war more committed to that way of thinking than ever. And so it deepened, reaffirmed those racial animosities. This generation of British colonists may have read about King Philip's War, heard about it from previous generations, and now they had their own war their own conflict with Native Americans. And as a result, they entered the war thinking of Native Americans as backward, savage, uncivilized, and they emerge more committed to that way of thinking than ever as they experience this close, intimate, intense, brutal form of warfare where Native Americans attacked the British, often took British settlers captive. It was war, it was brutal, it was intense. It was an 18th century war of particular grisly characteristics. And when this occurs, the British do not see the Native Americans as fighting for their freedom, their sovereignty. They instead see them as backward, savage, uncivilized. And that helps explain why in the decades after the Seven Years' War, you would, be ha you would see further efforts by the British to displace Native Americans, confident that they can never live side by side with them. 
One of the other insights that we are developing here in our first few lectures is the development of race-based ways of thinking from the very beginning, from the very early stages of American history. How in the 1600s, 1700s, uh, English settlers come to see Native Americans and African Americans as irredeemable, as if they are locked into a biological status as a function of their skin color that confers upon them inferiority so that they're worthy for of being enslaved. They are worthy of being displaced. It's a point we've made in these early lectures that a division of civilized and uncivilized that may have once hinged on religion, something that you can change, is through these developments in the colonial period shifting towards a division based on race, skin color, something you cannot change. And like earlier episodes with King Philip's War and Bacon's Rebellion, the Seven Years' War is another key beat in that rhythm, another part of that continuity. The British who fought against the Native Americans in the Seven Years' War began the war inclined to see Native Americans through this racist way of thinking and at the end of the war, they are more convinced than ever. And that's why after the war, they will refuse to live side by side with people they see as inherently biologically inferior. The war comes to an end 1763. We might dispute when it begins, 1754 or 1756, but there's no dispute in regards to when it ends. In 1763, a peace treaty is signed in Paris that recognizes the conclusion of the war and the victory of Great Britain. Great Britain wins the Seven Years' War clearly and emphatically. Great Britain wins the Seven Years' War with a clear victory. And as a consequence of that victory, the French Empire in North America ends. Yeah, I know Napoleon will come back and try to revive it, but that won't work either. Uh, so it is effectively the end of the French Empire. The land that the French had once claimed that you could see on this map um, from the Great Lakes region further south would be formally ceded, granted to Great Britain. So uh, you can see in this map what originally colored that dark shade along the Atlantic coast was the uh, land claimed by Great Britain. And now that land extends all the way west to the Mississippi River into this area, the Ohio River Valley, south of the Great Lakes region, that again was the focus of this conflict. Conflict began and the British won, and they now have claim to this. The French basically leave. They give their land to Great Britain. This is how Great Britain acquires Canada, for example. So this marks the end of the French Empire. One consequence of the Seven Years' War was the end of the French Empire. Napoleon will come back as emperor in the early 1800s and try to revive it, but that doesn't work, and that's why he later sells uh, that to United States um, in the Louisiana Purchase. So this is effectively the end of the French Empire. The French came, as we described in our second lecture, uh, for furs and faith, but ultimately their empire would be a big fail. Um, and that empire ends here in 1763. So one consequence of the conclusion of the Seven Years' War, the victory, clear, emphatic victory of Great Britain, was that the French Empire ends and the British, in the peace, acquire all of that land. In North America, the French Empire, that was once claimed by the French. Another consequence as a result is that Great Britain is now clearly the dominant power in North America. Spain entered the Seven Years' War on the side of France, so it too was defeated. It too was on the losing side, and it too had to give up some land to Great Britain. Spain doesn't leave North America. The Spanish Empire, as we talked about in our first slides in this lecture, would actually continue, and there were attempts to expand it in the late 1700s, but it too would again be eclipsed in power by Great Britain. So the French Empire recedes, um, or the French Empire ends, and the Spanish Empire recedes, making Great Britain the dominant power in North America, the big boss. We've talked in these lectures about some reasons, some trends, some characteristics that help us explain why, over time, the English Empire will become the most powerful 
populous and profitable. A lot of people came. They came for land, land, and land. They were more than willing to war against Native Americans. They benefited from uh, the introduction of pathogens that decimated Native American populations. They came as families. So in previous lectures, we've talked about why the English are so successful. And here, ultimately, is the definitive proof of their supremacy. 1763, the war comes to an end. Great Britain is victorious. They acquire the French Empire. The French leave. And Great Britain would now be the dominant power in North America. Consequences of the Seven Years' War for Native Americans are tragic. With the French exiting, they lost their ally. And now there's no buffer, no block between Native Americans in this region and the land-hungry English who now believe as a result of their victory that that land out there is theirs for the taking and they're going to come and get it. So Native Americans lose their ally. They lose whatever buffer the French offered in preventing further incursions into Native American land. And they lose that source of tribute that the French offered. They now face a land-hungry, full-on, determined opponent in the British who, as a result of that treaty signed in Paris, say, that land's ours now. And it doesn't matter if you've lived on this land for thousands of years, Native Americans. It doesn't matter that this is your ancestral land. We are going to claim this land. The British always coveted land, land, and land. They always associate land with their freedom, opportunity, and now they were more than willing to take that land. And remember, as I noted on a previous slide, the very experience of the Seven Years' War, battling close, intensely with Native Americans, seeing Native Americans raid settlements and take English citizens hostage, only deepened already existing racial prejudices. So not only do the British believe that that land is theirs legally, based on a treaty signed in Paris, not only do they covet that land because they want land, land, and land, they tend to see the Native Americans on this land, again, as irredeemable, as people who are inherently, biologically inferior, people that they see as unworthy of that land, people that they're not willing to accommodate to. And as a result, the colonial legislatures encourage their citizens to pour into this region, take that land. Even Pennsylvania, the colonial legislature in Pennsylvania adopts this much more aggressive approach. Up until this point, up until the end of the Seven Years' War, Pennsylvania, one of the 13 colonies established by the English in the 16 and 1700s, was the exception to the rule that we've enunciated in these lectures regarding the very hostile and aggressive approach of the English towards Native Americans. And that's because Pennsylvania was founded by a Protestant religious group known as the Quakers. The Quakers, like the Pilgrims and Puritans and many other groups, came to North America in the 1600s to form a religiously based society. We talked about the Puritans earlier, their idea of creating a city upon a hill. Well, um, further south in Pennsylvania had a similar group, Quakers, who again were Protestants fleeing persecution, who came to North America to establish a religious-based society. The leader of the Quakers was William Penn, P-E-N-N. -N. And so Pennsylvania, a colony, and then later, after the American Revolution, a state, is named after William Penn, the founder of the Quakers. The colony granted to him is the colony that's still, or state now, that bears his name. In fact, if you go to Philadelphia, the largest city in Pennsylvania, uh, there's this very high uh, statue above the city of William Penn, who's seen as the founder of Pennsylvania. And for a long time, uh, Philadelphia had a law that you could not build a building taller than that statue. So it would be the tallest thing in the city. Um, so Pennsylvania was founded by the Quakers, founded by William Penn and his group. And the Quakers, though they were also a religious group who came to North America, were very different than the Puritans of North America uh, who would clash with King Philip and King Philip's War in that the Quakers 
saw Native Americans as equals. In fact, the Quakers believed that all human beings were equal. They were all equal as children of God. The Quakers are different than all the other English groups we've described. They had an egalitarian approach to human relations. They believed all human beings are children of God. And so they didn't war aggressively against Native Americans. They established praying towns throughout Pennsylvania that were designed to welcome Native Americans, come and live closer to us. Uh, they believed that the best way to reach out to Native Americans wasn't by slaughtering them and taking their land, but instead converting them. And they did so in a very welcoming manner. They said to Native Americans, come and live beside us Quakers, pray with us. Uh, you'll want to, again, convert to our religion. And when Native Americans said, no, thanks, we're good. We don't want to be uh, Christians. We like our traditions. The Quakers didn't kill them. <laughs> the Quakers didn't respond to that by slaughtering them like the Puritans and other groups did. The Quakers said, oh, okay, well, don't worry. We'll get you next time. Uh, we'll, we'll convince you next time to come and live like us and wear one of these cool Quaker hats, right? Um, so the Quakers did not slaughter Native Americans. They also did not engage in slavery. The Quakers who founded Pennsylvania are also the exception in English America because they did not engage in the Atlantic slave trade as they saw Africans also as God's children, human beings. So Pennsylvania was founded by Quakers, but over time, the citizens of Pennsylvania become increasingly convinced to seek out land, land, and land. The original founders of Pennsylvania may have been true believers, like William Penn, but their ancestors, their grandsons, their great-grandsons, wanted what English settlers and all colonies wanted, land, land, and land. And so after the Seven Years' War, even Pennsylvania, which had hitherto previously been the exception to this rule, now they're on board with waging wars of aggression against Native Americans. Uh, the Quakers in Pennsylvania, who still controlled the legislature, were voted out and replaced by members of that legislature who would enact these policies that were much more aggressive towards Native Americans. And so even Pennsylvania now falls in line with the overarching, all-consuming demand among the colonists in English America after their victory in the Seven Years' War to seize that land in the West. And this is why the consequences of the Seven Years' War for Native Americans proved to be so tragic. And that leads to another conflict. In 1763, the Seven Years' War comes to an end and the French leave, the French exit North America. They give up their lands necessarily as a cost of their defeat to the British. And now the British are more than willing to pour into this region. A Native American chief named Pontiac in the Great Lakes region, who had previously been allied with the French, sees the clear threat that this poses to his people and their land and their freedom. Now, throughout these lectures, I've been stressing to you that for the English the British, they see land as a gateway to freedom. It symbolizes freedom, but that's true for Native Americans too, particularly when their land is now being taken from them through these acts of aggression. The British efforts to claim that land forecloses, denies Native Americans the freedom to live as they choose. And so Pontiac, a leader of a Native American tribe, with the defeat of his French allies, now sees this threat to the British that is a threat to his people, their land, and with it, their freedom. And he wants to prevent further incursion into his people's land and preserve their freedom now alone without the French and facing this land-hungry population of British settlers. And so Pontiac was a warrior. He would build a coalition of tribes who would launch a rebellion, an attack on the British in an effort to halt their further incursion into his people's land so they could preserve their land, their freedom, their right to live as they see fit. 
He was aided in that effort to build a coalition of fighters by a religious figure named Neolin. Neolin was a shaman, a, a religious leader in Native American communities in the area around the Great Lakes region. So if Pontiac was a warrior, Neolin was a priest, a religious figure. And he reached out to Native Americans in this region and said, we need to put aside our differences. We may speak different languages. We may um, have previously fought against each other, but we're facing a crisis, a crisis not just in terms of our land at stake, but our very souls, our very culture is at stake. Neolin added to the efforts of Pontiac by building a sense of a cultural or spiritual crisis among Native Americans of this region who are facing this onslaught that targets not just their land, but their religion, their traditions, their languages. And so he urged the Native American tribes in this region to band together in a common identity because for them, not only was their land at stake, but their very identity and their religiosity. The British are coming, they're coming for our land, and they're also coming for our very traditions and culture as they see Native Americans as backward, savage, uncivilized. And so you have this key event also in 1763, the year that the Seven Years' War ends, Pontiac's Rebellion, where Pontiac and Neolin work together to build this coalition of fighters who will stand up to the British, hit them hard, attack them, and convince them not to pour into this region that they have won in their victory against the seven year, against the French in the Seven Years' War. So this is the dynamic we've seen now. The British win, the French leave, and now the British are, in their mind, ready to claim this land. Pontiac sees the writing on the wall, and he builds up this coalition of fighters that he believes can protect his people and stop this incursion. And he's aided by Neolin, who works to deepen the sense of bonds and connection because what's at stake was more than just land, the very traditions and cultures of Native Americans in this region. Now, in these early lectures, we have been working to talk about solidarity, ways in which people see themselves connected. A lot of what we've talked about, again, is in terms of racial solidarity how over time in early periods of American history, well before the American Revolution, here in the colonial period, people began to think of who they were connected to and who they could never be connected to based on race. That's something we talked about in our most recent lecture in Bacon's Rebellion, the origins of white male solidarity, that what unites us isn't a common religion or a common class standing, but skin color. So in previous lectures, we've talked a lot about how white European settlers in North America came to see themselves connected based on that common whiteness. We got more of that here today in this lecture, which through an examination of the Seven Years' War talked about how that notion of racial difference between white Europeans and Native Americans was further solidified. But solidarity is not exclusive to Europeans alone. What we have in Pontiac's Rebellion is a sense of solidarity developing among Native Americans, a pan-Indian identity, meaning an identity that spans tribe. The Native Americans in this region, prior to the French arrival, fought against each other. They were different tribes, different linguistic groups. They had their own rivalries. The French come in and they ally with some Native Americans, but um, remain foes to other Native Americans. Again, one of the reasons why the French entered into alliances was so that they would have protection from other Native American groups. So there were divisions in this region for centuries, but with the British now as a common enemy, a common threat, with the French gone and Native Americans facing this potential onslaught into their region, what we see in Pontiac's Rebellion is a Native American solidarity a pan-Indian identity, meaning there's something that unites all of us tribes, that there is something that we can see as being Indian or Native American, a common experience against a common enemy, a common threat posed by the British, a common cultural body of practices, the animistic beliefs of Native Americans that's threatened 
by the incursion of hostile, aggressive, racist, dismissive British into this region. So if one of the themes here in our early lectures is the formation of group identity, and it will remain a theme because in our next lectures, we'll be talking about the American Revolution and how an identity is formed as being American. So a big theme in the whole class here is how we come to see ourselves connected to others, how we form a sense of identity and in doing so include some, but also exclude others. So far, when we've traced that theme of solidarity and connection, kinship, identity, it's been among white Europeans or white British settlers who say we're all white men and we deserve this land. But there are other groups in early American history, as witnessed by Pontiac's Rebellion, here Native Americans who are seeing themselves connected in a common identity and common experience. Pontiac builds this coalition. Pontiac builds this confederation of fighters that spans tribe, unites tribes that had been previously foes, antagonistic to each other because they do have something in common, something they can now recognize. As a result, Pontiac launches a series of attacks on British settlements in the Great Lakes region. You have this event known as Pontiac's War, Pontiac's Rebellion. He builds up this coalition of fighters. They have a common identity and a common experience, a common threat. They want to preserve their land. They've lived in this region for thousands of years. When the French were here, there weren't too many French settlers, so they were really able to maintain their control of that region and work that alliance system to their advantage. But now the French are gone. How will they hold on to their control of this region? Well, Pontiac hoped to hit the British, hit them hard, and convince them to back down. He hoped that if he hit the British hard enough, they would see the consequence of pouring into this region and say, oh, wait a minute, maybe that's not such a good idea. Pontiac launched this series of attacks in an effort to dissuade the British from pouring into this region. The British might have believed that this was their land for the taking. They won. They won the Seven Years' War. A treaty was signed in Paris that says this land's ours. But Pontiac wanted to demonstrate to the British the costs, the consequences of doing that. And he launches a series of rebellions against the British. He forms this formidable, strong coalition of fighters, and they fight in their name for freedom, a freedom to maintain this land, and with it, a freedom to live as they see fit. So this too is an outgrowth in 1763 of the victory of the British in the Seven Years' War and their determination to wrest control of this land. Seeing that as a threat, Pontiac launches this series of attacks. Now, Pontiac doesn't rout the British, defeat them. Really, Pontiac's war is a draw. There's enough British settlers in this region to absorb these attacks. But the attacks are strong and determined and so the British see that this is a real problem, that we can't just pour into this region because there'll be more of this. So Pontiac doesn't crush the British, defeat the British, convince them to go back, but he does do enough damage to urge the British government to now be cautious. And that leads to the proclamation line of 1763, where the King of England will draw a line saying, don't go past this point. No settlement west of the Appalachian Mountains. The king says to the colonists, yeah, I know we won. I know that land's ours. But, you know, if you head out there, you're going to piss off those Native Americans and they're going to attack us. At the end of the Seven Years' War, Great Britain won a great victory against its rivals, the French and the Spanish. At the end of the Seven Years' War, Great Britain is indisputably the dominant power in North America. In fact, it would be now the dominant power around the globe, a status it would enjoy until the end of World War II for almost 200 years. So Great Britain's not only the dominant power here in North America, it's the most dominant, powerful nation in the world. But it won that victory, enjoyed that status at a great cost. It went deep into debt to win the Seven Years' War. And now it has this expanded empire that, as we've learned in this class, can be as much 
a liability as an asset. Having a big bitchin' empire might seem cool, but you have to control that empire. You have to defend that empire. And Pontiac's rebellion demonstrated to the king of England the difficulties of now controlling that region. If we pour into that region, uh-oh, that means the Native Americans are going to fight against us. And that means we're going to lose a lot of people. We're going to lose a lot of money. In order to defend this region, we have to spend more money, build forts, send more soldiers. And again, at the end of the Seven Years' War, Great Britain is deep in debt. It doesn't have the money, the resources to really control this region. So the king says, let's hit the pause button. Let's draw a line and prohibit our citizens from going past that line and make their way into that Ohio River Valley. Because if you do, you'll get more Pontiac's rebellions. You'll get more rebellions. And that's a big pain in the ass for me, the king, and I don't have the money to deal with it because I'm deep in debt. So let's just stop westward expansion until we can do this in a more deliberate and concerted effort. And so you have the proclamation line of 1763, where the king is saying, no westward settlement beyond this line, beyond the Appalachian Mountains. For the king, this is his desire to control his empire, to manage this difficult situation where, yeah, he's got a bigger, larger empire, but it's onerous and difficult to manage. He's deep in debt. These Native Americans in this region aren't going to be so kind to the arrival of us settlers. And so he says, let's draw the line. To him, it makes sense. To him, it's reasonable. But to the colonists, what is the king doing? when he draws that line and saying, you can't take this land. He's denying them what they dream of, what they aspire to, land, land, and land. And what does land mean to these colonists? Freedom. Pretty soon, in lectures to come, we're gonna talk about the American Revolution, a rebellion that breaks out in these 13 colonies and from it forms the American nation that is the focus of this class in History 102. And quite often, the story of that American Revolution begins with a Stamped Act and a number of taxes and regulations that the king imposes after the Seven Years' War. But even before the Stamped Act is levied in 1765, there is this first act that sets in motion a collision between the goals of the king and the dreams of the, of the colonists. That is the Proclamation Line of 1763, where the king is drawing a line and prohibiting his citizens from what they see as their birthright, as their goal, and the means by which they are free. So the Proclamation Line of 1763 is actually the first step in that American Revolution by pitting the goals, ambitions of freedom of the colonists against the king. So we end our study of the Seven Years' War by really indicating where we are coming to examine in lectures to come, the origins and development of an American Revolution, where in 1763, the king does something really sensible, really reasonable. He draws a line and says, don't go past this line. Because if you do, it's a big problem for me. It's a big problem for all of us. We'll have another war. And he's got his own worries. You know, the king's over there in England. He's got a lot of war debt. He's got all kinds of problems in England and Europe. He doesn't need to send all of his soldiers to North America to fight against Native Americans in the West. But when he does this seemingly sensible thing, he's setting in motion a collision between the interests of the crown, the interest of the king, and the goals of the colonists who say that land's ours. It's ours because we're British citizens and we have a right to private property. It's ours because we won. We won. We defeated the French. We defeated Native Americans. It's ours because the Native Americans don't deserve that land. We do. It's ours because it's what makes us free. And so the actions of the king here really set in motion a divide, a cleavage that later will intensify into a revolution.